Now let's get into something that photographers talk about all the time, but oftentimes do nothing about, copywriting your work. Everyone is talking about who owns this and I have my rights and people might have taken this from me. You can clear all of that up by copywriting your work with the Library of Congress. Now what is copyright? Copyright is your ownership of the imagery that you make. When is an image copyrighted? From the moment you take it. But what I think a lot of photographers would be shocked to know that even though you have the copyright because you were the image creator, that does not afford you the legal benefits of statutory damages and legal fees from someone who you try to go after if they stole your image. Now by stealing your image, that's called an infringement. Infringement really is when someone uses your image without your authorization. Now there's two different kinds of infringement. There is innocent infringement and there is willful. Now, if you copyright your work, the courts have already put together statutes of how much money you can get. Willful caps out at $150,000 of damages per image. A regular infringement only goes up to $30,000. Now, how do you prove if something is a willful copyright infringement? The best way starts with you to tag your imagery as copyrighted. How can you put a copyright on your work? You can put it up in your image title, you can put it into your cameras, almost every one of the cameras now you can put in ownership information, as well as every image editing software has this capability. Photoshop, Lightroom, Capture One, I'm not going to tell you which software you need to use because all of them offer it. I have a batch option to put copyrighted notice on every single one of my images as I'm ingesting them and as I'm renaming them. But the most important thing is to actually put in metadata attach it to each of your images. Someone can claim innocence saying, I didn't know that it was copyrighted. There was no way for me to know. So if you put the copyright information in the title of the image or in the metadata, it makes it much more difficult for them to claim innocence. So you found someone who has infringed upon your work and you're the copyright owner because you took the picture, but you've never registered it with the Library of Congress. Where does this leave you? Let's say you have an image of a girl walking down the beach holding the hand of a child. That image is then taken from the internet and used for a resort. Now the onus is on you to determine how much money has that resort made directly from that image, how much money have you lost based on them using that image, and has it devalued the image at all. So determining those three things is a very complicated mess and especially on the side that you have to find out how much they made directly from that image what do you do reach out to the same resort who infringed upon you who you're saying you want money from to say I need all your data saying how many times did someone click on that page did anyone ever click on that image how much money directly resulted in someone paying you to book a room at that resort how much money did you make from the alcohol sales from those people you understand that it's a rabbit hole, one thing to another to another to another, and each time your lawyer has to request from their lawyers to get that information. This can drag out months, years, and all of a sudden your lawyer fees are astronomical and you are fighting a resort, a corporation who has a lawyer on retainer. The second part, you have to prove how much value it is to you. And if you haven't sold images for stock or resold images and you just put it up on your Flickr page, you don't necessarily have a quantifiable dollar amount of how much that image is used. Myself, I have resold images. So what I have used in infringement cases is previous sales of images of that image or similar images and how much people tend to pay me for those licenses. That helps establish my value. Third, you have to quantify the damages to your business that they stole this image and how it hurts you. The image could be used for something to associate it with a brand or a culture that you don't want it associated with. It could become a meme, it could go viral, and your image will never have a commercial value again because anyone who ever thinks about it thinks about that meme. How do you quantify that? How do you put a dollar amount on that? It's really difficult. So, the simple solution to all of this is if you copyright your image with the Library of Congress, you are afforded legal leverages and legal rights that solve all of the things we just talked about. Let's talk about the benefits. You copyright an image with the Library of Congress, and you do so before any infringement or 90 days after that infringement has happened, and you will be afforded the legal rights of the US copyright law. What are these rights? What are these benefits? First, you don't need to establish the value of your image or the value that they received from using that image. It's gone to statutory damages, which means a judge 
issues a statutory fee based on the fees that you asked for in your lawsuit, and that is what is awarded, and that is what they are liable for. What do those fees look like? It's up to a judge to award those reasonable fees to you based on what you had asked for in the lawsuit. Statutory damages on non-willful infringement go from $750 to $30,000. They cap at $30,000 for non-willful infringement. Now, if they willingly infringed on your work, which again, as long as you've made it abundantly clear on your imagery that it is copyrighted, that is a willful infringement or indication of willful infringement. That can go up to $150,000. That's where it caps out. So how do you say, well, they willfully infringed it? If you go and find the image they have on their site and it has no metadata any longer embedded into it, you can make the claim that they stripped the metadata from it before they put it up on their site. If there's a watermark that they cropped out or removed, or if they took and changed the name to get rid of the copyright notice in the title, they have willfully infringed on your work. This is a gold mine. Most photographers are afraid to put work out in a bunch of different avenues because they're afraid people are gonna steal it and reuse it and they're losing money and losing business. If you copyright your work in a timely fashion before you publish it on any websites, including your website, a Flickr, anywhere that you may post an image, you have the right now to go collect money from people and this is a legit revenue stream for a photographer. Another huge benefit of registering your work with the Library of Congress is that you have the right to get your legal fees compensated by the person who stole and infringed upon your work. On the flip side, if you have not copyrighted your work with the Library of Congress, you have to cover the legal fees that draw out from trying to figure out the value. That really is the cumbersome part and why people don't sue people when they steal their image. Imagine the resort, in my example, has a legal team and has millions and millions of dollars that can go ahead and work on this for as long as they need to in order not to pay you. That is a major, major hurdle to get over. So if your legal fees would be paid because you copyrighted this work, all of a sudden, you don't mind putting out the time. So your lawyer is willing usually to take it on contingency, which is if we win, the lawyer gets 50%, you get 50%. Lawyers love when you have a copyright registered with the Library of Congress and someone steals it, and they look at it and say, we can make some money, of course they're gonna do it on contingency. Now, if you don't wanna give the lawyer 50% on contingency, you can pay them hourly, and you pay your fees up front knowing that when you get your copyright case won, that all of that money will be reimbursed with the payment for your image. I know for me, my intellectual property lawyer charges $400 an hour. Because my work is copyrighted whenever I even go to my lawyer, it's a pretty airtight case. So I'm not worried about paying him by the hour because I know that the bills are not gonna rack up huge now what's huge to me or what's huge to someone else may be different. My bills in an infringement case typically run up in the three, four thousand dollar range. Now this is money I have to pay him to do his services, but I know that I'll be getting it back. Now, if you don't have thousands of dollars to bring a lawyer in on retainer, you can do contingency. Lawyer gets 50%, you get 50% upon winning. To recap, there's two major benefits. You get statutory damages awarded by the judge and you do not have to prove what that value is to you. And two, your lawyer fees can get covered by the defendant or the losing party who infringed upon your work. That alone is enough to pay for the copyright fee. Now what does it cost to copyright something? If you copyright a single image or a single work, and when they say a single work, that's a one book, it's a record, it's a CD. This applies to all artists and everything that is created. But for photographers and videographers, that would be a single image, a single video, a single motion picture, whatever the case might be. Now, you can put together and register groups or batches of work at the same time. To do one, to do the single work is $35. To do a batch is $55. And there is no limit on how many images you do at the same time. Now I register these all electronically. So you say, my images are huge, how can I do all of these images and send them to them electronically? It's gonna take me days and days to transfer them. This is where you prepare your work beforehand and you batch process your images to be small. I do mine 400 pixels wide. We know 400 pixels wide is like a postage stamp. It's small, 
but the image is still clearly being able to be seen. I save them all as JPEGs and I put thousands upon thousands upon thousands in a folder. I organize them according to year or if they're published or unpublished. Published and unpublished go under two different categories. You can only register a batch of published together or a batch of unpublished together. Ideally, you're registering all your work before you put it out anywhere on a website or before you give it to a client. Did you hear that? I register all the work that I do as jobs for a client. Just because you're being paid to do a job and just because someone is giving you a contract saying, hey, we're gonna pay you for this work, you need to register your work before you give it to them. Has anyone ever heard of a situation when someone didn't pay their invoice or someone has reneged on their obligation to pay you? It happens. It could be a pain in the ass to go after a contract breach, but if I have this copyright in my back pocket, easy, they're always gonna settle. Again, if you listen to anything I say in this tutorial, copyright your work before you send it to your client. If it costs you an extra $35 for one work, if it costs you an extra $55 for the entire shoot or a body of work, this is money that will protect you and has the potential later to make so much money for you. And you say, man, I shoot a ton of work. Okay, batch process it, do month by month, so it's only $55 a month. The one time you do a copyright infringement, it will pay for all of your infringement fees. All of them. You may be shooting weddings, you may be shooting landscapes, you could be shooting anything, and you don't think that your work is really gonna be infringed until it is. You submit all your wedding photos to that couple, and then all of a sudden, you see that image somewhere in an ad. It happens. You, there's news stories about it all the time. I'm sure you can figure out some stories on f-stoppers. They're everywhere about when your image shows up in a place that you had no idea of it. You don't necessarily know how it got there. You don't have to prove how it got there. You only have to find who's using it and say, you're using it and it's mine. So when I say all of your fees will be recovered, you say, but I thought the lowest price was $750. Let me tell you a story. I love stories. This is about a World Cup fan that I had taken a photo of. I did a whole bunch of World Cup fans from a whole bunch of different countries leading up to the last World Cup in 2014. This particular image in this particular instance is for a Portuguese fan who I had photographed going like this. Let me show you the image. We went ahead, rented a studio, had talent come in, painted his face, took photos put this out on Flickr, on my website, all these places. What did I do? I registered the copyright to him and all 27 people I photographed that day from different countries. I put in my metadata, copyright information. You see it, it has my name, all my information, it has how to get in contact with me, and right here under copyright status, copyright it. Copyright notice, copyright symbol. Again, that's option G on your keyboard. Monty Isom. So when you see, when you add this in the metadata, look right up here in the image title. Photoshop puts a copyright symbol in your file. Anywhere it's open, it'll always show a copyright symbol if you do this within Photoshop or within Bridge. I assume it's the same whenever it's coming through Lightroom or any other imaging editing software. When I register this online and send it to the Library of Congress, this is what I get back from them. It's a certificate of registration. It has a registration number, all my information. Down here, applicant's tracking number, fans of the World Cup. That's the title of the work up here, fans of the World Cup. So I did all of my fans at the same time for a $55 fee. So I have my work copyrighted. How do I know if someone's actually infringing upon my work or how do you even find these people? There is a company called Digimark and what that does is it's a paid software solution that embeds a watermark into how they save the image. It makes it trackable online and sees where your images show up and they send you a report or you can go on and sign in online to check out what images show up where. Now there's an alternative that is free that anyone can use. I use it a lot. It's Google Images. If anyone's ever done a Google image search for a kitten or anything else, you know how to use it. But something that's really, really cool is that you can take an image of yours and you can drag it right into the search bar and it will go and search the internet for any image that is visually similar to your work as well as look for that image specifically. You can also add keywords to kind of specify the search, but check this out. I just dragged one image on here and visually similar images. When you look at that, 
One, two, three, four, five, six of those images are mine. It's pretty damn good. This is just, again, a file I threw on here. So, it suggests Portugal soccer fans, because that's the title that I have in the title of the work. What does it do? Pages that include this image, that match this image. Someone on Pinterest, Pinterest, Vimeo, my website, my blog, and it goes on and on. And you can go through one after another after another of where it appears. It appears on the makeup artist site, it appears on Flickr, it appears throughout the internet. So what you're really looking for when doing these searches is a commercial venture. Someone who is using your images to make money, to sell a product, all of these things. If it shows up on a blog, blogs are fairly small usually. Usually it's a one person doing it. If it's a magazine's blog or a company's blog that is a commercial venture, then I'll be interested and go after it. Really I'm looking for people who have made ads with it or capitalize on it to try to make money. Now you see Elizabeth Yoon, she's my makeup artist, she's awesome, of course it's on her site, of course she has rights to use it because she has asked me and this is our deal. So when we start getting into other things that are designed that have your image in it, I wanna take a little deeper look and see where we're finding them. So as you see, I see something pops up here that uses my image. That would be something I further investigate. Now let me get back to my story. I did an image search on Google Images, just like we went through, and I came across a website that was using my image for a media company, for a magazine kind of publication, where they're referring to him as douche fan, and kind of douchey World Cup fans who really kind of put themselves up like they are something that they are not. All of a sudden, my image is now associated with douche fan. That's not gonna be good for business. That's not gonna be good for anybody. I go through, I do some screen grabs. I do a screen grab to show me what the website has to see how it's placed. I do a screen grab to see what kind of advertising is going on on that website. I go to the source code to see where it appears on the website. And where do I see? They actually rename the image douche fan. With this, I go and look at the image to make sure I have all my metadata in place. Of course I do. I do screenshots of that as well. Why am I doing screenshots of all these things? It's so then if I have to go on a legal route, I have all of this to give my lawyer. It establishes when it was up, it establishes I've already put metadata on it, this copyright has been removed, they've renamed it douche fan, off to the races. So I shoot off an email to the managing director of this magazine or this publication. I included the copyright notice that I received from the Library of Congress when I copyrighted this work. I also go on to say that one, they've infringed upon my work. Two, that I need to be compensated for not just the infringement, but also the devaluing of my image because now it is forever known as douche fan image on the internet. You know when something gets on the internet, it's not easy to get off. I get no response from him. I follow up with him a day or two later, I restate my case, but at the end I say, to prevent any legal action, you need to contact me within the next 24 hours. My only response from him was, we have removed the image. I write back, excellent. Now let's talk about compensation for the infringement and the devaluing of my image. Nothing. Well, I gave the guy three chances. So I bring all that stuff into my lawyer. I show him the metadata, I show him the image, I show him the disparaging douche fan commentary as well as that they have renamed my image and stripped away my metadata. My lawyer, is very, very excited about this and says, if you'd like to do this on contingency, I'd be happy to take your case. I looked at this case and said, man, this is airtight. I'd like to pay you hourly. He looked at me and said, that's a good move. So my lawyer writes a lawyer letter to these people. Lawyer letter states, we have seen an infringement. It has devalued my client's work. It's a forever gonna be associated with douche fan. We would like $25,000 from you in order not to litigate this. If we have to litigate and take it to court, we'll be asking for $150,000 in damages as this image now has no commercial value. They don't respond. They don't respond to a lawyer letter. I mean, if I get a lawyer letter, I'm responding. So I'm including the lawyer letter in this tutorial as well as I'm gonna include the, the correspondence that only began once we filed a lawsuit. We actually had to file a lawsuit in the federal court of the Southern District of New York. And I have to say, within four hours, 
we hear from their attorney. Magic, right? So when they come to us, they say, oh, we're ready to give you $7,500 you know, to make this go away. We, we did infringe on your stuff. My lawyer checks with me and I say, $18,000 I will settle for plus my attorney fees. He goes back to them, they say, oh, that, that's way too high. Let me see if I can get my client to do it. They come back, oh, we can give you 12,500. Well, my lawyer says, I don't think he's gonna go for it. He asks me if I wanna go for it. What do I write back? Litigate. They come back to him, hey, we can offer 15,000. Now we can offer 16,500. Now we can offer 20. At every turn, all of a sudden, they're authorized to offer more money because every single time I go back to my lawyer and say, I'm holding firm, I'm sticking to my guns, I know I have this case, and you know what? 18,000 plus lawyer fees or litigate. We've already filed our motion in court. Well, you can only guess what happened. All of a sudden, they found $21,500. That's $18,000, exactly what I asked, plus $3,500 in lawyer fees. So, my lawyer gets 3,500 bucks on his $400 an hour. I get $18,000. You say, Monty, it costs a lot of money to copyright all my stuff. I shoot all the time. At $55 a piece to do batches of your work, you could have copyrighted 30,000 images, 32,000 images for what I just got paid on one image that was infringed upon. And because I copyrighted it, I got paid. You understand where the math is here. It really does pay to copyright your work. And if someone goes and takes it, you really do have a legal grounds to stand on. You don't have to compromise and you can say, this is what I want. If you have copyrighted your work, it is an airtight case. They infringed, you copyrighted it, they're screwed. I highly recommend you copyright your work if you listen to anything. I know I've said that a couple times, if you listen to anything, but this is really the one. If you listen to anything, protect your work, protect your stuff. You would protect your home, you put locks on your house, why wouldn't you protect your work? So now, how do you register your copyright? First thing you do, go to copyright.gov. That's the official website of the Library of Congress. I have their homepage up. As you see, it's clear as day. Register, copy, right, right up on the top left. Now, I wanna show you, they have a fee structure laid out so you don't just take my word for it. Basic registration, single application, that is a single author, one work, one claimant, and it was not a work for hire piece. That's $35. Standard application, that's all the other filings. That's doing a group, that's doing a whole shoot, that's doing 5,000 photos, 1,000 photos, eight photos, whatever it might be. That is the normal one, that's $55. So, the fees are there, you get an idea. All of this is available on their website, remember. Now, if this is your first time doing this, you can go through and they have a whole help desk and frequently asked questions. Take a look through here, what file sizes are available, what file formats they accept. They accept almost all file formats. If you're feeling that uploading a lot of individual files is a pain, you can take them and put them in a folder and zip them. They accept zip files. We are actually gonna walk through and copyright a piece, an F-Stoppers tutorial that is right now on the cusp of coming out because we copyright all of our tutorials to make sure that whenever people are out there possibly taking them or stealing them, they are actually infringing upon a copyright. As soon as I'm done filming this and editing our tutorial, you be sure that we are gonna be copywriting it. So if you're watching this because you downloaded it from a torrent or you got together a group and you did a group buy, that's a whole bunch of people who put in a little bit of money to buy it or someone who actually buys it and then rebroadcasts it on Reddit, on a torrent, you better change your IP address, delete your accounts, or you might be hearing from my lawyer. And let me tell you, he's pretty damn good. Now, let me walk you through a copyright registration. We go in, copyright registration on the left, copyright a new claim. Register a claim in these three steps. Are you registering one work? This point, we are. We're only registering one tutorial. So this is gonna be a cheap one, it's 35 bucks. Are you the only author and owner of the work? Yes, F-Stoppers owns the copyright to their tutorials. Does anyone you are sending contain material created only by this author. Yes. I click start registration. They give you some important information about the stuff. Go ahead, you're gonna find all this out on when you do your first copyright, which I hope is really soon. Type of work. We're gonna select uh, motion picture or AV work as this is an audio visual file. 
motion picture work or audio visual consisting of a series of related images, feature films, television shows, videos. Good. Now if you notice, their navigation on here is really, really old school. It's like 1994 built or something crazy. So bear with it, figure it out. It is there, it is logical, but it is, might not be up to snuff to what you're used to for website navigation. Title of this work, Photographing the World 3 with Elia Licardi. Does this work appear in a larger work? No. Continue. Has this work been published? No. Year of completion, 2017. Pre-registration number. Now you can pre-register a project before you finish with it, but we haven't pre-registered, so we're just gonna hit continue. As we go through, and we're putting in all this contact, it's who's the contact if they have a question, where are they gonna mail it? All of that's really straightforward. So, as you see, they have a special handling section near the end. Is there anything uh, in here that needs special handling? You know, pending or prospective litigation. If you just found a copyright infringement of your work and you're just now registering your work, you may want to put the pending or prospective litigations. I certify that I'm the author. So we filled out all the information. We make sure everything is correct. What it is, it's a motion picture work, the name of it, it's made only by one company, which is F-Stoppers, one name, 2017, it's in the United States. We have all the organization name, the claimants, who has, who has what, who needs what, and what we're gonna do is hit add to cart. Add to cart means check out. So what you do is you pay for it and then you upload your stuff. Now you are leaving uh, ECO, Electronic Copyright Office, in order to pay. Do you wish to proceed? Okay, payment successful. Click the continue button to complete your registration. Okay, submit your work, here we go. So now we're gonna submit some work. So you have to collect, select files to upload. So here we select the file to upload. Now your files can only be up to 500 megabytes a piece and there's an upload limit of 60 minutes. So if you have a really slow connection, you have to consider how much you're gonna be trying to upload. Most people with high speed internet can upload 500 megabytes easily within an hour. And if you have more than 500 megabytes, when you're doing a large registration of a large amount of work, it's oftentimes more than 500. So you can select multiple files and put them on there. With tutorials, they're really large files. So we're gonna break it up into four files. So again, like JPEGs, when I said you can do 400 pixels wide, you can take video and put it down to like 480. It doesn't have to be some 4K file. It can be VHS quality, so then you can send it in. It's approachable enough, but as long as the Copyright Office can see what it is and knows that that is a unique work. Once we get this uploaded, it's gonna take a little while. We'll show you the end where it's completed, and you get a case number. Upon that moment of upload and case number issued, you are officially protected by the Library of Congress. You do not have to wait to get the certificate. It's from the moment of completion of your upload. As soon as they have it registered and confirmed that they've received it, you're in business. Now, this is registered in the United States Library of Congress. So, does this give you protections in other countries? If another country steals it, what, where does that leave you? Well, there's a publication called Circular 38A, and that's International Copyright Le Relations of the United States. This shows you what countries have treaties and agreements with the United States, which as copywriting in the United States, really gets you protection in most countries in the world. For instance, I'm in the middle of one in Portugal for the same exact image that I showed you before. Someone again stole it, even though it's douche fan. But here we go, when I'm looking up Portugal to see what their relations are with the United States, they have agreed in the bilateral July 20th, 1893 accord, the Bernie Paris, March 29, 1911. Basically, they've gotten in every treaty for copyright that the US has ever entered into, going back to 1893, all the way up to 2010. So I'm fully protected by my copyright in the country of Portugal, and that's what a Portuguese court needs to know and the Portuguese lawyer that I've hired. So this is not just protecting you where you reside, it protects you in other countries also. As I've mentioned, I have a lawyer in New York, but if you're going after a copyright infringement in a foreign market, I highly recommend you get a lawyer in that market. They will know the local laws, they will know what it costs to put forward any litigation, and that is gonna give you the most teeth. If someone in Portugal gets a lawyer letter from New York, they're gonna be like, eh, it's New York. But if they get it from someone in Portugal, most likely they're going to adhere to what it says. Now there's some photographers who actually use this as a whole stream of income, where they 
photograph a whole bunch of images that they think probably could be stolen. They put them out on a lot of public websites displaying their work, make sure they're well tagged so they are found for whatever subject matter they are. They might even put them out higher res knowing that someone might take them and use them and they just go after people for copyright infringement. It's an entire career. I don't necessarily agree with that being your career. I believe in going after people who have taken my images or infringed on my copyright, especially for a commercial product, especially for them to make money. And again, as you're watching this tutorial, this will be copyrighted the moment we finish editing it. So you can understand the importance of copywriting your work. One, you're protecting yourself. Two, you're protecting the value of your work. And three, you may make some money on this as well. Let's go back. We copyright the work. If you're looking to see if anyone is infringing on it, it's Google Images. You can also use a digital software solution called Digimark. Check them out. It's a subscription base. I think it's $99 a year. It may change yearly, but that is something where you watermark it into how you actually save the image. It doesn't put your name across the front. I find watermarks on an image to look very unprofessional, but that's me. It actually saves it in how it saves the JPEG. So that tags those images. You put it out into the world. If anyone takes that image, then Digimark can track that image by the code that it puts into the saving of it. So that is an option. Google Images, I showed you an example. It works awesome too. You might not have to put the 99 bucks a year. It's up to you. With that, if you get infringed, you put together your information. You do your screenshots, you capture your metadata, you make sure you have all the information you need, you get your certificate that you've already received from the Library of Congress. You send that in an email to the person who's infringing upon your rights. Tell them what you're looking for. Tell them exactly what will happen if they don't. If they don't, contact your lawyer. Lawyer, get you paid. So I promised I was gonna talk about the copyright situation that I made more money in one day doing nothing than I ever have in my entire career. Well, I had an image that I had shot for a client and it was of LeBron James. And what do you know, after the campaign comes out, we've already licensed it, the agency comes to me and says, we'd like to use the image from our campaign for a commercial. And I said, okay, and I gave them a number. I gave them a number of $7,500. And they said, you know, the producers say it's too much money, you know, the most they'll do is $5,000. I'm thinking immediately, $5,000 to put my image in a commercial that's gonna run nationally of LeBron James is too low. So my response to the agency is, I'm holding firm at $7,500. If the producers think it's too much, then they should find another image for the commercial or rewrite the commercial. I never hear anything back. I'm in a bowling alley in Phoenix waiting for an airplane. I'm watching the Super Bowl. What do you know? Commercial comes up on the screen. There's my image, loud and proud on a Super Bowl commercial. Now they didn't even mention Super Bowl commercial when they were asking me for my price. I wouldn't have said $7,500 for Super Bowl. We know the viewership on that is huge. So what do I do? I reach out to the agency immediately like, hold on, what just happened? Now I had copyrighted the work already. So when I'm speaking to the agency, at first they're responding to me when I'm saying, what happened here? We have a copyright infringement in every country the Super Bowl runs in. Do you know how many countries that is? A lot. Well, when they started dragging their feet and not responding to me timely to try to remedy this situation, because they didn't really have an answer, I started just raising my prices $10,000 every other day that they would not respond to me. They brought in a new art buyer to deal with the project. She asks me, what is the number to make this go away? Well, I originally wanted $40,000 for the infringement, but because they hadn't been getting back to me, I just started upping it $10,000 every other day. So I gave her a number, $101,000. Why was it 101? Just because I'm funny. It wasn't because it should be 100, it wasn't because anything. I just said $101,000. And she said, let me go back to the client and see what we can do. She comes back, $101,000 purchase order issued that day. What did I do? Absolutely nothing, except copyright my work and protect the value of what I do. You would think they would never hire me again. I just ran away with $101,000. Wrong. They respected me for standing up for my work. They know they made a mistake. They paid for it. I've worked repeatedly with that same agency year after year. This goes to show you're gonna wanna copyright your work, but most importantly, you're not gonna wanna give full rights away. If I would have done a buyout with them or given them unlimited usage, that's $101,000 I make less in my life. And that is my LeBron story that made me the most money by doing nothing. 
I love getting a notification that there's a copyright infringement from a commercial venture. I know that's money in the bank. There's one other place that I find a sure thing for money in the bank, and that's an audit from the IRS. Sounds weird, but I have made money on every single one of my audits from the IRS. Right now it's IRS zero, Monty Isom two. Let's get into everyone's favorite topic, taxes. Let's get excited.